Health Organization declared it a global pandemic uh, with about 20 cases or 20 deaths, let's, let's say, that they claimed were caused uh, by the swine flu virus, which they said, you know, was coming ultimately from here or there. But, you know, they declared a global pandemic and they changed their definition of pandemic at that point so that if you read it carefully, widespread death, no, we don't have to have that anymore. We would know. So they declared the threat. The CDC, Centers for Disease Control in the U.S., the World Health Organization, they're the two big megaphone public health agencies that stir up all the fear and plant all the articles in the press and so on and so forth. So now we come to the summer of 2009 in the United States. The CDC is claiming that there are thousands of cases in the U.S. All right. Now, Cheryl Atkinson, who at the time was a star investigative reporter for CBS News in New York, she discovers a very strange fact. The CDC has secretly stopped counting the number of swine flu cases in America. The reason they exist, at least originally, was to do that, to count cases and report. Every week they have a morbidity and mortality report that they publicly issue about whatever diseases they're on to. And they've secretly stopped counting cases in the U.S. while continuing to blare forward that there are thousands of cases of swine flu in the U.S. So naturally, she says to herself, so I wonder why they stopped counting. And so she begins to dig deep and she finds out why. And it's because the overwhelming number of tissue samples from patients, swine flu patients, that are routinely sent out to labs for testing and analysis, this is ongoing all the time, are coming back with no sign of swine flu or any other kind of flu. They have to, they have to conceal it and they have to pretend that it's not happening, but she knows. So right. she writes an article about it. And naturally it has to go through all kinds of uh, stuff at CBS. You know, the lawyers have to come in and her bosses and everybody has to look at it. And her boss tells her that it's a hell of a story. Never saw a story like this before about swine flu. And they run with it on the website. And it's published. Okay, so now the next step would be to put it on television, which is the real deal as far as the public is concerned. To put it on the nightly CBS News. To put it on all the affiliate CBS television news broadcasts. But now something happens to CBS. Now, all of a sudden, the kibosh is put on. We are not going to put this story on television. We're not going to do this. We're not going to, and there's going to be no follow-up. And in fact, the CDC makes money off of their vaccine patents, and they're in business with the pharmaceutical industry. I think they make about $4 billion a year, according to Kennedy. So they have a serious conflict of interest because... They can't get the swine flu vaccine adopted and mandated unless there's a swine flu, right? Exactly, exactly. Right. So I'll add one more little tidbit here, the capper on this whole story. About three weeks to a month after CBS shuts down the whole deal on swine flu, I find an article at WebMD stating that the CDC, you see that at this point now, uh, uh, the official word is, well, the epidemic is starting to tail off and whatever, and it's now time to reflect a little bit and say, you know, what was the effect of it all? So in this WebMD article, the CDC estimates that there were, get this, in the U.S. alone, 22 million cases of swine flu. So one that you've talked a lot about is the absence of, you know, proper water and sewer systems throughout many parts of the world and the conditions of low immune system that it makes. 
So I remember when you were covering AIDS, you went into that a lot. Another is chemical warfare. And you've pointed out if you're going to do biowarfare, you know, viruses are hard to control. It's much easier to use chemical. And especially when you can combine it with EMF, you know, and cellular systems. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So chemical warfare, I mean, in the largest sense, let's say corporations have bought up all the farmland, the good farmland, so that people can't grow their own food, so they're hungry, they're starving. Uh, there's a, uh, the corporation also, some spinoff, uh, has uh, industry factories there producing whatever. And so the, all the locals are working for the corporation there, and pollution is running out like rivers all over the place. Chemical warfare. I mean, this is, the let's say, the broadest definition of chemical warfare. But it's real because it keeps the population controlled kills off people, new people are brought in, they have to work there, otherwise they make nothing whatsoever. And, you know, they are sick, debilitated, they die, new ones come in. Uh, I mean, it is chemical warfare in the broadest sense. And then on top of that, the bosses, the dictator of the country, the corporations, they need a cover story. You know, they need a cover story to explain why these people are dying. Right. They will, you know, what can we do? Uh, let's see, uh, hey, Ebola. You know, you press a lever and suddenly everybody springs into action. Suddenly the stories start appearing. Bleeding, hemorrhagic fever, people falling down, with blood everywhere, and frightening. It's going to overtake the world and this and that and the other thing. And the main reason for floating that cover story was to cover up the real chemical warfare that was taking place. Okay, so that's one level. Right. But the other level is, hey, we don't know about germs, you know, they're just too unpredictable and they could work on some people, others, nothing, we don't, we just don't know. And plus, if it does work, I mean, maybe we could get it to, some wise old psychopath says, let's do a chemical and we'll say it's a virus and this will work because we know about chemicals, how long it's uh, toxic, how many people it's going to kill pretty much how long it lasts, and then when it disperses, and then we can say it's all over. Yeah, this is good, and nobody's going to look for it. It's undetectable in that sense because we're going to promote the idea of a virus. So let's spread this chemical wherever we want to, small town, big city, doesn't matter. And then we'll come in with the story that it's, a, it's suddenly an epidemic. CDC sends their virus hunters and that's a whole other story. They have these guys on tap. They send in with blinders because these are all true believers. Whenever they have doctors and researchers, whenever they get sent out by the CDC, they're going to find a virus. Oh, I don't know everything. I do know, however, that two of the enemy's greatest weapons are lies and fear. Now we can defend ourselves against lies and fear with knowledge and a sober mind. I shared with you what I did because I hope that you'll think outside of what we're being told. Question everything we're being told, both in the so-called mainstream and alternative news. Look somewhere else. And I think that maybe we'll find some truth. I can give you a testimony that in my family, even though we'd lived uh, a lifestyle that was much healthier than most people we know for a good many years, four or five years ago, we really made some drastic changes in our diet and what we would put on our bodies. And I'm talking about the filthy chlorine, chlorine water that we get from our municipality. I'm talking about shampoo and deodorant and toothpaste. We got rid of our microwave, our television, stopped leaving the Wi-Fi on all the time. Teresa and I don't worry about whether or not our phones are on. We shut them off during the day. Not concerned about whether or not we can text or call each other any second. And I got to tell you that we experienced what I could only describe as a health renaissance. And there's a lot of people in our big family, a lot of examples of minor and moderate um, 
health issues that we had essentially melt away. I can tell you that I lost a lot of weight. I can tell you that my inflammation and pain, my serious, severe allergy symptoms went away. And then about three years ago, we noticed some pretty distinct changes in two things. Number one was our, our weather, so to speak. We could look up and see where we once had sunny skies pretty much all year round down here in the Gulf South. We'd have days where we couldn't find the sun. And we started paying attention to that and seeing that we could watch the planes or drones or whatever they are crisscross the skies, block out the sun, turn the skies to weird milky gray. And we started dealing with some of those health issues again, most especially our respiratory issues. And I gotta tell you that we don't have, we're not sick with bacteria or virus. We don't have fluid in our lungs. We have inflammation and irritation. And you know, that's due to the toxic environment that we live in. It's toxic and we need to be aware of it. The other thing we noticed was that, well, here come the smart meters and the fifth generation cell towers. If you've not checked out Mike Morales, his YouTube channel, he does a great job breaking down the weather modifications that are absolutely going on. A lot of people think that's crazy, but there's a lot of evidence out there that says it's anything but. And when he shows what's going on up above us from satellite imagery, it always coincides with what we can look up and see. And we'll be told, uh, and I've been paying close attention to it, that we're going to get some cold weather coming. And it's never from the jet stream dipping down, bringing Arctic air. What it really is is people screwing around with the ionosphere, blowing all the crap they've sprayed up in the sky somewhere else. But it comes down on us when they do. We'll watch for two, three days, our skies literally disappear. And then will come the cold weather and winds, and our skies will clear up. And before that cold ever comes, we start suffering with these respiratory issues. But we're learning almost day to day how to better care for ourselves and each other and to combat these toxins that we can't avoid just want you to think differently about what you're being told is reality. Are we under attack by a virus? Or is it our toxic environment? Both in the electromagnetic fields and the chemicals that we're exposed to. It's absolutely, at the very least, some of both. Why do I share what I shared about MSG being in vaccines? Because I want to show you that something that most people would consider innocuous, something so simple as MSG can cause pretty serious breathing issues. I shared in one of my videos about some of the disinfectants that could be being sprayed and the health effects that they have. I can tell you that I watch a truck drive up and down my street supposedly spraying to kill mosquitoes. And I shared with you what's in that spray. It looks a whole lot like what we're being shown. Those pesticides and the sort of things that they can cause. And if you've not looked into how EMFs, microwaves affect us, and how these things can really work in conjunction with one another, it's a place to start looking. There's a lot that we can do for ourselves and our loved ones to be prepared for whatever's coming our way, even if we don't know exactly what it is, it starts right here, right with us, right in our own homes. What do we choose to take in and put on and breathe in and be surrounded by? There's a whole lot we have no control over. But I believe that if we seek the truth look other places than where we're being told to look. That we'll find real answers. And we'll be prepared for whatever's coming. So, I wish you all the best. Until next time.
Shalom, friends.